Well, here we go again. The workbench is empty, but not for long. So here's one of those projects that I got a while ago. Picked it up at the swap meet for an entire 20 bucks. And quickly went into storage at the back of the barn. You thought I would have forgot about it, but it's back. Now, I do have a Mint Pro Mac 1010 sitting in a box. And I had a video on that. Uh, scored that thing, cleaned it up. It's in amazing condition. Runs great. I can't bring myself to use that thing. It's way too nice for me. I mean, I'm used to something that's a bit ratty and rough around the edges. Something's going to get used, scratched, beat up a little bit. And that thing is so mint that I am feeling guilty about using it in everyday operation. So, when I was able to score this thing uh, for cheap, it sort of ran when I got it. Uh, the guy flooded it when he tried to start it, but, uh, you know, I think we'll make a run. It's got this awesome heavyweight and jagged pull start handle, which is great for removing skin. Um, it's got the uh, full reach around handle on it, and I kind of thought that was factory. But upon further inspection, I believe that's a piece of conduit that's been bent in the shape. But we're not going to buy anything new. We're just going to throw a fresh layer of tape on it and call it good enough. Now I do have to address a little bit of seller's remorse related to this saw. Years back, I actually got a, another Promac 1010 powerhead before I even really knew what the Promac 1010 was. And it was seized up solid. Uh, the internals were pretty well botched. However, there were some good parts on the outside. And rather than just throwing it in, in the scrap pile, I ended up taking it apart, piecing it, and parting it out, and selling off the pieces. Wouldn't you know it, years later, I somehow start getting into these things. I wish I would have kept all them pieces. Going to end up paying twice as much as I sold them for to buy them back. Because you know I'm going to end up needing them same parts. That's just how it works. So the practical method would be to go through the fuel system, put a new spark plug in it, some fresh gas, sharpen the chain. Well, we don't need practicality. We need a 28 inch bar. Now, why 28 inch you say? Well, hopefully that's long enough to avoid having to bend over a lot to, you know, delim a lot of stuff. And it's also, you know, what Buck and Billy Ray uses. So of course that's what I need too. And I kind of like the underdog overachiever saws. I'm a little bit partial to the steel 026s. I got a couple of those. One of them I worked over a little bit, you know, and the thing runs good. So, you know, why stop at just putting a bar on it? We might as well tear the entire thing apart for no good reason to port this thing out, inspect the internals, and, uh, you know, create a lot more work for ourselves. Because it's never really a project, you know, unless you regret getting into it. All right, let's start tearing this thing apart. Well, can't find a standard, so metric will have to do. I mean, you get close enough, like on a 13 millimeter, and 11 millimeter, and 8 millimeter, you know. You don't need all those different type sockets. Whoop, there went something. I don't know if there's supposed to be two of these plates in there, just one. I can't remember, I'll have to go watch another video. Well, save that chain for the other saw. Now, I don't like to keep track of any of my bolts or nuts when I'm taking things apart. I prefer to throw them all into one uh, pile and sort it out later because, you know, that makes you a better mechanic. Uh, we need a 7 16 but 11 millimeter is found first, and that's what we're going to go with. And don't worry, that wasn't the wrong size socket. I just stripped that out from uh, negligence. Once again, 11 millimeter to the top of the pile. Maybe we'll just try and take the entire saw apart, even though it's all standard. Uh, with metric tools.
And the nice thing about videotaping this as well is, you know, you don't have to worry about where keeping track of where parts went. Um, you just come back, watch it, figure it out later. screw and um, hopefully as we're dropping pieces on the floor most of that sawdust is falling off because we don't really want to clean this stuff heck of a deal on this $12.99 for a case usually goes for twice that if you can't get it for a case of beer it's generally out of my price range there's got to be a easy method of you know order of operation a disassembly on this thing we're not really paying attention to any of that um, just going from one thing to the next however as you can see from the amount of sawdust inside the air box I don't think that filter was doing quite a good job oh yeah there's the remainder of the oil it's a good thing we got that dripping on the floor all right after a bunch of uh, head scratching we got the thing of what was that? Okay, I think it's just a fuel filter. We got mystery parts shaking in here. Normally, I'm paranoid about anything getting down inside of the piston area, but since we're taking this thing the complete way apart, it's all going to get cleaned anyways. You know, that's clean. So we finally got our first look at the piston. I mean, yeah, we maybe ought to get some of that crap out of there, but she's not completely screwed yet, so fingers crossed, maybe we'll be able to salvage some parts. Well, I wasn't quite expecting this. It looks like we've got points. Now, usually I don't have a point, but I mentioned that because, I don't know, I thought these things were CDI. So after using the compressed air to thoroughly coat myself in oil and sawdust, we've got the block sort of cleaned up here and we're in I mean so f well <laughs> I mean as much as I like reusing parts I think that crank seal might be toast dang I was hoping to not have to buy too many parts for this that pistons not perfect but it's better than I was expecting I thought there'd be at least one side had a decent amount of scoring on it because when you pulled it over you could feel that it would kind of creep pretty easily so maybe it's just the rings are a bit worn down but um, I don't see much there either now I started spinning these things and there's no locator uh, pin in here you know usually you always have the uh, pin you know the, the rings away from the exhaust so that the ends don't catch on the ports well then I looked in the cylinder what in the world kind of porting is that? That's madness. The shape of those transfer ports. Now, I'm guessing that's to avoid the rings snagging and give a direction to where that you have the transfers aiming, you know, towards the back there, which is what you want. But I've never seen a setup like this. And you can see here, she's got a dual exhaust port. Uh, with a bridge in the center. This looks to be in pretty good shape. We'll probably just hone it out afterwards. She's got a hemispherical head shape to it. Sweet. So you've got, it almost looks like a flat squish band. Now being that this thing is cast in one piece, we can't really mess with the head gasket at all to get any extra uh, compression out of it. It's all one piece. So we're probably stuck with what we got as far as compression goes. Now if you want to see a slightly more structured approach to taking apart one of these 10 pens, uh, Bellhopper on YouTube has got a pretty good uh, video about taking them apart. Uh, I watched it. It was informative. I ended up forgetting half of it and uh, just kind of improvising as we went. So we're here at this point now and we're ready to start coming up with a plan to make this thing cut faster. Now if I was thinking, you know, I would have taken a reading on the squish, which is the distance between the top of the piston and the top of the cylinder head in here when the piston comes all the way to top dead center. And you use that measurement 
uh, you know, there's a safe clearance as far as how far it can come up here, uh, all that type of good stuff, but we need it to accurately figure out the port timings for this cylinder. But we didn't do that, and we're kind of too far along now to uh, get that reading. You know, hindsight's 2020, but hoarding beats that. So we're breaking the old Mint Mac 10 out of storage here to get a squish reading. Would you just look at that? Just look at that. All right, so we did the squish test. And what that involves is taking a soft piece of solder here. You know, you don't want acid core or rosin core, just plain old, uh, you know, lead-based solder. And you put it down inside the cylinder, and you just roll the motor over easily, and it smashes the, the solder, and it takes a reading on, on how close the piston comes to the head. And this one's coming in right around 60 thousandths of an inch. So, since we're going to work this thing over, hopefully, get a few more horsepowers out of it, you need to figure out what you got, first of all. And to do that, you got to make a port map of all the, uh, you know, exhaust, transfer, and intake ports that are on the cylinder. Now, you don't need a whole lot to do this. Basically, a sheet of paper that you roll up into a cylinder, slide down into the cylinder, push it all the way to the bottom, make sure it's flat, you know, and contact all the way around it, you know, tape it up, secure it, whatever, and then you get down in there and you push against the paper to indent all of those ports onto the paper. And what you end up with is a port map. Now I've traced the indentions with a pencil so you can see them better, but this is essentially what you got inside of that cylinder. Now what this enables you to do is uh, take some measurements off of this port map and figure out your uh, port timing. So you can figure out how much duration of exhaust port you have, same for the transfers, and same for the intake. Although, being that this is a uh, piston port motor, uh, the height of the skirt impacts the intake uh, duration. Now since we push the paper all the way to the bottom of the cylinder, you have to account for that squish right there. So when the piston comes all the way up the top dead center, it stops just short of the, uh, the top of the, you know, the head. You need to use the measurement from the top of the ports up to this line here. So we ran some numbers on all the port durations. Uh, there's some nice calculators out there you can find in Excel sheets and stuff that makes that a whole lot easier, you know, so you don't have to do all the complicated maths yourself. Now as a comparison to the chainsaw, here's a port map off a snowmobile engine. And as you can see, other than being obviously scaled up, there's actually a lot more exhaust port timing and duration on the sled engine versus a chainsaw. Now generally, more exhaust duration leads to higher RPM and higher, higher peak power at higher RPMs. Now a chainsaw spins pretty fast, so why wouldn't you have a lot more exhaust timing on this? And I'm guessing that that has to do with the exhaust itself. Sled engines either have a tuned exhaust or a can that you know adds a bit of restriction. Chainsaws basically just have a you know a restriction plate, I guess you could call it. And that's it. There's no uh, ac actual expansion chamber uh, that takes the sound wave. You know when the piston comes down here, your shock wave goes out into the exhaust and it reverberates back into the exhaust to add some extra compression into the cylinder. So as much as I want to change things up and go with the normal style of expansion chamber two-stroke porting, we're probably going to hang pretty close to stock on this because, you know, these, these saws ran pretty good from the factory, so I don't want to change it too much. But there is one glaring problem. That bridge in the center of the exhaust port. Now that's just blocking flow. And that's blocking horsepower. So we're going to port this thing out because you always need more power and uh, those trees ain't gonna turn themselves into sawdust you know by themselves now the first route I was going down is just widening and opening up these exhaust ports it's one of the best ways that you can add some extra power and flow you know breathability uh, to an engine like this you know you kind of get a feel for how much area you have for your transfer ports how much you have going in in the intake and you know you're gonna need at least that much going back out the exhaust well we're kind of lacking on the stock setup here with just those two uh, small ports going through. However, 
after looking at this setup, we actually ran into two major problems why this wouldn't work. The first being, there's no locator pins on this piston for the rings. Normally there's a locator pin to keep your uh, ring ends in uh, a certain spot so they don't travel over the exhaust ports or the intake ports and snag the end and break. Well, they have these ports so small that the ring end gap, uh, it doesn't actually go in towards the port. It's, you know, gapped close enough that the uh, ring can basically be in any position around here and not snag it. The second problem being these windows in the side of the piston. If you make these exhaust ports any wider, they're actually going to overlap beyond this notch here, and you're going to short circuit on your intake uh, when the piston is at top dead center right through the exhaust. We can't have that. We're wasting horsepower. So the logical choice would be put this thing back together stock as is and just let it go. We're not logical, and this is where our plan is. We're going to get rid of that bridged exhaust port completely, open it up into a nice large window, and also do some modifications to the transfer ports along the way to get even more flow through there. Say goodbye to those puny little ports. Now you're probably saying, hold up. You can't have the ring get into this exhaust port. It's going to break immediately. And that's right. So to solve that ring snagging problem, we're just going to make our own locator pins in the piston to keep that from happening. And I've heard of this being done before. I've never actually seen it done. But if you get one of these number drill bit sets that go way down into the small sizes, you get into some... Well, that's the hole size you're going to need. And basically you go up one size drill bit after you drill the hole and you just break off a little piece of this and we'll press it in there. And there will be your high strength steel ring uh, pin. Now we are running into some problems trying to reuse all the old parts. Those are the stock rings right there. And as you can see, there's a little bit of a, an excessive ring end gap. I mean, the ring end gap shouldn't be as thick as the rings are themselves. Now, the stock piston's not terrible of shape. It's got a little bit of wear to it. However, I couldn't find any rings for this thing, you know, from the OEM. So, we had to buy a whole new aftermarket piston uh, just to get new rings. And this new piston actually has thicker rings uh, than the OEM one. If it would have had the same thickness rings, I'd have considered running the OEM piston because I'm sure it's a better quality, you know, than this uh, probably Chinese-made piece here. So that might make life a slight bit easier when we're trying to drill and pin these. We also got some new crank seals as well. So now the hard part is how are we going to actually use one of these tiny little drill bits? I don't have a drill small enough to use that. I mean, all we got is the regular old uh, DeWalt here. And I was looking through the random drawer, and I've got this, um, I don't know where it is, a pin vise. Now, this thing, it came with some really small drill bits, and uh, I don't know what else, augers or something. But it has a little mini chuck on there. And that little chuck would actually hold a uh, drill bit that size. So while uh, trying to take things apart on here, see how it would work you know maybe we could adapt it over and uh, use it on the drill I was pushing on it and the problem appeared to solve itself because this broke in half nothing but a little bit of plastic on there I guess with this uh, center metal portion so we'll just keep on breaking it down and I think we can use this as a collet to put this in the drill and then use that little uh, holder to actually hold the drill bit Sometimes breaking stuff is the solution. That'll be just right. So granted, these drill bits were only like $11, but they are so terrible. I mean, I don't know if you can see, but that's the factory grind on that bit. That doesn't look like a normal drill bit to me. I mean, this thing might drill through butter. Like, the rake is completely wrong. But at least they should make good dowel pins. Hopefully. As long as they are actually steel. 
I mean, these are supposed to all be different sizes, but we got two of the same here. Um, so we're going to use this as the drill for the hole, and we're going to use this one as the dowel pin. So we should have 3,000 interference. Hopefully that's enough of a press fit to keep it in there. I mean, this piston's only going to be spinning at like, you know, 15,000 RPM, so not too big of a deal. So it's time to drill these holes. And, you know, we could take it to a machine shop, but uh, uh, they said they couldn't hold the tolerances that we need. So we've got a piece of scrap, a drill, hose clamps, a marker for a spacer, and some scrap steel. And what we're going to do is, this is all going to hold this piston here, sort of where we need it, at the level. And we're going to move, feed the piston into the drill bit and try and keep everything aligned. Because if you even breathe on this drill bit, uh, it's going to break in half. So this is going to have to be precise work. Um, no beers for this one. And we are drilling. And there it is. We might have started drilling off center on this one, but we caught it early. No big deal. Well, since that part's done, there's no excuses, just alternative uses. So now that we got both holes in there, they're drilled about a consistent depth. Uh, we've measured the depth of the pin, and we're going to figure out how much uh, of that pin we need hanging out there to actually stop the ring from rotating. Now these rings are not made for a pin, so we're going to get in there with the Dremel and take a little notch out of the corner, not taking any of the outside of the ring, that's your sealant surface, but just the inside corner. So you want the ring to kind of overlap over top of the pin. And we're just going old school with a file. It's amazing what you can do with a little bit of time in one of these. Just a little bit at a time. So there you go. You know, files are a very underrated tool, in my opinion. I mean, you got to get some good ones now. The cheap Chinese ones just don't hold an edge. And it's tough to find some good, you know, domestically or, uh, you know, good quality uh, files. But when you got one, you can really move some material. Uh, they're precise. They're controllable. And it's, you know, I see a lot of people going straight to power tools or a grinder or something. When a lot of times, you know, a few good strokes with a file and you can remove that material quick, leave a decent finish, and you're done. So file that away in your memory banks. So the pin will end up sitting right in the middle of the land. Sort of like that piston there. So there we chopped up the drill bit into our little pin, 175 thousandths long. And we've got the first one installed. Now we just need to get the other one started in there and give it a little tappy tap tap and that should be done. There she is. One completed pinned piston. Now we can finally start working on everything else that goes into this engine. One thing to mention when you're putting the pins in here, you want to make sure that the ring ends don't go over any ports. And you also want to make sure that the pins don't break through into the piston. Now that's maybe not a showstopper, but I tried to run it into that thick portion of the aluminum there so we wouldn't drill the whole way through. Well, now that we're done with this, we can put it back into service, uh, holding down the roof. Now we run into a little bit of a challenge trying to get these captive needle bearings out of this piston. I mean, basically, we've got to press each one out of these little uh, ears on here without breaking that and without damaging the bearing. However, they're separated here. You can't just put this in the press and start pressing on it. We'll break them in half. So we found an old cap screw, cut it in half, and this piece right here, this slug, will fit down in between those two ears, and it's just the right size uh, to press through there and pop those out. Using the old vertical vise to get those bearings out, so there we go, single exhaust port. We did some other uh, crazy stuff down in there. I think it's about time to put it back together. Nothing says horsepower like a pile of dust and a Dremel tool. That's definitely the proper way to hone a cylinder. 
Well, I don't know what happened, but this project got put onto the back burner for like a month, which is just enough time to forget how everything came apart. So it's gonna be a bit more of a challenge to put it back together. Oh man, that's a lot of bolts. Most pieces only go in one spot, so we should be fine. We're making progress. Now this is the kind of stuff that takes a lot longer on projects than you anticipate. So this is the gasket that goes on the uh, oil tank cover here. Well, I forgot it's split. So there's actually a gap right there where it should be sealing. So now we got to custom cut one of these. There goes 20 minutes. Sure, you could probably buy one of these, but I ain't paying for that. So when you're making a gasket like this, and you've got that large inner cavity to cut out, you know, you just jam the scissors through there, and you start cutting, you know, radially out. And getting this big chunk out of the middle will give you a little bit extra work room here to cut the rest of it out in detail. So we filed the mounting points for the points, so we can get a little bit extra advance in that. Giving the carpetator a 10 minute tune up. Hopefully we can save these diaphragms, don't have to buy any more parts. So we've got a slight problem with the fuel line. This is one of those specially made uh, fuel lines that goes from like quarter inch at the carb down to like three eighths of an inch. And that's the grommet all in one that goes through the tank bulkhead. Now we're not going to be able to exactly make this. All we need to do though is go from a filter, seal off at that 3 8 inch hole, and then get to the carburetor. Well there's got to be a way to do that somehow with a combination of regular fuel lines. So we got to get creative to actually size up this quarter inch fuel line which will go onto the carburetor, but it's a loose fit going through that grommet there. So we need something to expand that. Well, I grabbed an old pen, chopped off the top, punched the hole through it there, and it's even got a taper to it. So we're going to jam this into the fuel line where we need it to seal, and this will actually be a nice tapered fit that it will kind of push through there, stop, and it should seal it off perfectly, all with one piece of fuel line. Perfect. Let's jam that in there like that. We had to jam a piece of eighth inch fuel line onto the filter to act as a spacer up to the quarter inch line. Now that is a premium fuel system. Business card to uh, set the coil. Well the leftover bolt pile is slowly dwindling away and I have yet to actually go back and watch any footage of how I took this thing apart so we're still winging it. Um, you can probably tell me actually what I'm doing wrong because I don't know yet. So I don't have a new spark plug so we found one that's slightly less used you know having a pre-soiled plug that'll just help speed up the uh, reading process while we're tuning well, we got the recoil torn apart and giving it a new rope and we're gonna put one Phillips on the entire saw just to make myself angry the next time I have to work on it we're getting off all this hack job electrical tape and installing some professional grade friction tape and that is about it. We got to put the bar on there and stuff and the chain and you know we should test fire it to see if it runs first but we're just going to keep putting parts on it and then find out later. Did check for spark however and we've got that. Oh yeah look at that bar. And there it is. Stole a pull cord off an outboard motor but it'll do for now. And She's ready to go outside and see how much oil it leaks or if it snags a ring. Hopefully not. And I'm like 99% sure that extra bolt was nothing important. You know, that's, that's why you fill stuff up only halfway. So when it starts leaking, it doesn't completely uh, drain itself. So yeah, hopefully them gaskets just swell themselves shut because we don't feel like taking this apart again. We'll run it without the cover now, just to make sure everything is working kosher. Make sure the fuel line doesn't kink. Whew. Well, she's got compression. 
So we'll have to adjust this linkage. The choke wasn't getting to the full on position. So we had things together for about an hour, and now we're back to this. Rebent that linkage. Now we've got full choke. That old cork gasket was pretty dried out and brittle, so we're trying to bring some life back into it and let it soak in water for a couple of days. not looking too bad. It likes to run a little bit on the rich side. <laughs> 